Well, good morning, church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's a little bit rainy here in the Antelope Valley today, so if you're worshiping with us online, stay dry. I know there are people watching all, worshiping all over the country. Thank you for being a part of our service today. Uh, we're continuing our New Beginning service or series for the message. We got two messages left. It's Communion Sunday, as you can see, so if you're connecting at home, Make sure you grab some kind of elements, bread, crackers, juice, even waterworks, whatever you have, uh, will be an opportunity to connect to the power of the Holy Spirit as we share in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Our worship team is here, got some great music in store, and I'm taking you to Disneyland during my children's time, so stick tight. We're going to get started in just about five minutes.
Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. We're so glad that you're here. Those that have joined us here in the pews and those that have joined us online, welcome. It is wonderful that you're all here to join us for our communion service uh, after the second song. Those that are on, that are online, uh, if you can get your communion elements ready, because after that second song, we'll be celebrating communion. Uh, bread, juice, anything that you have in the house to represent the elements would be great. That way we can all celebrate communion together as one body of Christ. But we're going to start our service off with Mighty to Save. Would you please stand and join us? Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior, the hope of nations. Savior. find me in all my fears and failures fill my life again I give my life to follow everything I believe in now I surrender Savior he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory. The risen King Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He goes and conquers. celebrating communion. us to worship 
You may be seated. It is the first Sunday of the month, a chance to gather around the Lord's table. If you're connecting with us online, whether it's live or uh, on demand, we hope that you'll have an opportunity now to gather whatever elements you have uh, in your, on your person, in your house, wherever you may be, as we share in the sacrament of Holy Communion. In the United Methodist Church, all are welcome and invited to God's table. If you're here with us in person, Pastor John will be sharing for those on this half. I'll be on this half. If you need gluten-free uh, option, let us know. We have that available as well. All are welcome and invited to God's table. The Lord be with you. Let us lift up our hearts. Let us give our thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, our Alpha and our Omega, whose strong and loving arms encompass the universe. For with your eternal word and Holy Spirit, you are forever one God. Through your word, you created all things and called them good, and in you we live and move and have our being. When we fell into sin, you did not desert. You made covenant with your people Israel and spoke through your prophets and teachers. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And so with your people on earth and all their company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, 
Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is Jesus Christ, who called you Abba, Father. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embraced a people as your own and filled them with a longing for a peace that would last and for a justice that would never fail. In Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead the same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory and poured out upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. And on the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread he gave thanks to you. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts, that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed by the, as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood. As the grain and grapes once dispersed in the field are now united on this table and bread and wine, so may we and all of your people be gathered from every time and place into the unity of your eternal household and feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now let us... Pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, praying, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you're worshiping with us at home, we invite you to take whatever elements you have now and share it with whoever is there uh, with you. If nobody is there, we are here with you in spirit as well. If you're here in the sanctuary, we invite you to, to come forward and receive the elements. If you want to stay and kneel at the communion uh, railing, you're welcome to or return to your seat. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Thank you. 
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise you. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery, which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would the children please come forward this morning? I'm not going to say good morning, kids, because I'm going to show you. I do it on the video, but I wanted to show you something. Did you know that it is either Chinese New Year or Lunar New Year, and it's the year of the dragon? That's right, year of the dragon. And I want to show you something pretty cool that I did to celebrate Lunar New Year. Ready? Let's watch. Well, good morning, kids. Good morning, saints in the congregation. Great to see you this morning. Um, hey, did you know there's a festival going on right now? Well, I mean, you have to go to Disneyland, but uh, it's the Lunar New Year Festival, right? Sometimes they refer to it as Chinese New Year, but there's all kinds of Asian communities and cultures that all observe the Lunar New Year. So I went down, you know, because I love you, so I could do the research uh, this week, and here's some of the things I saw at the Lunar New Year Festival.
Wasn't that amazing? So cool. And uh, I tell you this because in our Bible story for today, it's not the Lunar New Year Festival, but it's the Pentecost Festival. And back in Jesus' day, Pentecost was the festival of the wheat harvest in May or June. And people from all over Israel would come to Jerusalem so they could be there for that celebration. Well, after Jesus' death and resurrection, he told the disciples to, to wait because something amazing was going to happen. And it was on Pentecost that Jesus gave them the Holy Spirit. He wasn't there, but they experienced this power uh, from God, and they were excited about being the church uh, to tell others about God's love. And really, it's the birthday of the church. And on Pentecost, on that special festival, uh, the early Christians decided this is what we want want to do forever and ever. And that's why we have church now, because of the Pentecost festival and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. God, we thank you so much for celebrations when we can come together as a community uh, for Pentecost, for Lunar New Year, for other celebrations when we rejoice with one another. We are so grateful that your Holy Spirit empowers us to be the church that you've called and created us to be. Help us to love you and love others now and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. See you next week. So, <clears throat> kids, some of the not-so-young people might not know who was that at the very end. Who was that that we got to see? M May Lynn, yeah, May May from Turning Red. And so this was her first year, she and her mom, first year coming to uh, the Lunar New Year celebration at Disney, so that was pretty great. Oh, you remember that part in the video where the lady was pouring some kind of brown, gooey, like, syrup kind of thing? That was burnt or browned sugar and they were making she was making a dragon in fact i bought one for you guys unfortunately it's very fragile and it kind of some parts of it have broke off but all it is is browned sugar so i'm going to give it to miss beth and you guys can take apart the dragon and uh taste what a sugary dragon tastes like for <laughs> lunar new year all right all right have a great time in sunday school Thanks, kids, for connecting online. We'll see you later. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Pastor Jim. What a fun uh, trip to be able to go virtually to that. Um, some of you were here on Wednesday and were able to enjoy a Chinese New Year meal at Food for Thought. Cece and Mike Garella and Lori Shaw put together some uh, chow mein and some spring rolls. It was really, really yummy. Um, and so here at the church, we're always doing something fun, and there are some things that you might want to be aware of that are upcoming. Uh, something that actually has already started, but it's not too late to sign up, is Grief Share. We've mentioned this in S Sundays past, but just want to mention it one more time. If you haven't signed up, and if this is something that you need in your life right now, if you're watching online or here in person, it started this past Thursday, but it's not too late to sign up. You can catch up very easily. Uh, meets every Thursday night, and so you can register on our church app. Uh, I didn't bring my phone, but this is my this is my invisible pretend phone. <laughs> and if you go to the church app, uh, you'll scroll down a little bit, and you'll see Grief Share. You can also find the sermon notes for today on the church app. You can give to the ch church app. It's very useful. Um, also, a week from today is our Ignite Super Bowl party. Um, so how many of you knew that next week is the Super Bowl? I just learned today, because clearly I don't pay attention to anything, I found out that the Pro Bowl is happening to this weekend. I'm like, okay. Anyway, Super Bowl is next weekend, and so we're having a, a party for our youth at 3.30 in the Fellowship Hall. And so just uh, see me or look at the emails for more information about that. The In-Betweeners group um, is, has now made up a, a schedule for 2024, and they've got one for almost every month. The next one that's coming up is February 10th. It's going to be a, an Italian dinner potluck uh, at Andy and Sal's house. Um, so see Don Osterley or Rick Hill for more information about that. And then at the end of February, um, how are we already in February? I do not know. Um, at the end of this month is the next Messy Church. And so if, you, if you've never been to Messy Church, it's a 
an event for all ages. It involves crafts and games and a Bible story and uh, just a really, really fun time. We even feed you a meal, and that's going to be February 25th at 5 to 7. So mark that on your calendars. Since Valentine's Day is going to be this month, the theme for, for Messy Church is love. So something that you will certainly enjoy. I don't know who is against love. Is anybody against love here? I think we're all for love. All right, good. So I'll see you at Messy Church. Um, as we move into a time of prayer, um, we've got, um, we're going to lift up our North District Covenant prayer list. And this week, it is a, le- a lesser known church, Palmdale First United Methodist Church. I don't know if you've heard of that church. Uh, just kidding. That's us, of course. So this week, you can be pray- praying for our leadership. You can be praying for the ways that we are reaching out to the community. You can pray for our ministries uh, and just prayers in general for our church. Uh, so be thinking about us this week and be lifting up a prayer for our church and our community. The 11 o'clock service, we do uh, a full-bodied, active form of prayer in the form of prayer stations. And you'll see up here on this uh, altar rails, we've got candles that you can light. You can use that as a form of prayer. uh, And as you light it, be lifting up a a, a silent prayer for yourself or someone that you love and know. Or perhaps even for Palmdale, the city of Palmdale or our nation as we move into primary elections. Um, So just whatever your prayer might be, you can lift up a prayer and then feel free to stick around and kneel or stand to continue your prayer there. At the back two walls, we've got um, a photo prayer wall. Um, And these are a variety of different photos, Um, a couple related to our scripture reading for today and some uh, of a variety of different um, types of things. And so for this photo wall, choose one or maybe uh, a few photos to stand in front of and reflect on this question, which photo connects to your spirit today? You might even want to take a look at all of them and then Find one that connects to you and uh, use that as a way of praying to God. Um, How does that speak to what God is doing in your life or or the things that God is bringing to your mind? And then back here we have post-it prayers. The question is, how can PUMC make a difference in our families, community, and world? So take a sticky note, write down a prayer. um, How you think that we can be uh, uplifting our families and our community and our world? For those of you that are worshiping online, we invite you to respond to that question in our chat section um, so that we can hear uh, what your prayers might be. And as for those of us that are here in person, as we're making our way around, there are some offering boxes scattered throughout our sanctuary. um, And also you could always give through our church app as well. You can even set up a recurring donation if that's something that works for you and your budget in 2024. Let's now be in a spirit of prayer. Invite you, if you are willing, to get up and move around and find a prayer station or two.
we thank you for dwelling in this place with us, Lord, letting us uh, be transformed by the working of your Holy Spirit from the inside out. We pray, God, that that would be what happens here at our church amongst our families. Lord, that we'd be inspired by your love, Lord, to reach out into our community and our world. Lord, to be that healing and hope-giving place of refuge. Lord, may it be so this week in our, in our lives and in amongst uh, the people that we meet. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you rise as we listen to today's scripture reading from Acts chapter 1, read by Jody White. Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Acts, the first chapter and the first eight verses. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated.
As we move into the message, there are a reminder there's sermon notes on the app. If you'd like to follow along, it's always the first item you see on the home screen when I'm preaching. Let us pray. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, storyteller Anthony DeMello in his book, Taking Flight, tells the following tale. After many years of labor, an inventor discovered the art of making fire. He took his tools to the snow-clad northern regions and initiated a tribe into the art and the advantages of learning to make fire. The people became so absorbed in this novelty that it didn't occur to them to thank the inventor who one day just sort of slipped away from their midst. Being one of those rare human beings endowed with greatness, he had no desire to be revered or remembered. All he sought was just the satisfaction of knowing that he had been able to help someone else, that they had benefited from his discovery. The next tribe that he went to was just as eager to learn the art of making fire as the first. But the local priests, jealous of the stranger's hold on the people, had him assassinated. To ally the suspicions of the crime, they had a portrait of the great inventor enthroned upon the main altar in their temple. And a, a liturgy designed so that his name would be forever revered and his memory kept alive. 
The greatest care was taken so not a single part of the liturgy would be altered or omitted. And the tools for making fire were enshrined within a casket and were said to bring healing to all who laid their hands upon them with faith. The high priest himself undertook the task of compiling a uh, life of the inventor. This became the holy book with the inventor's loving kindness being offered as an example for all to emulate. His glorious deeds were eulogized. The superhuman nature made an article of faith. And the priest sought that the book would be handed down from generation to generation while they, uh, they authoritatively interpreted the meaning of his words and the significance of his holy life and death. And then they uh, ruthlessly punished with death or excommunication anyone who deviated from the doctrine. Caught up as they were in these religious tasks, the people of this tribe completely forgot how to make fire. When I first read this story, it had a jarring impact upon me. Of course, it's a made-up story, but it made me stop and wonder if my own Christian faith was more about keeping religious tasks than it was about keeping the fire alive. Welcome to the fifth week in our First sermon series of the year, New Beginnings. We've been examining various stories from the Bible that all deal with uh, a new start or starting over. And, and we re I recognize that not every week's topic and passage will connect to where everyone is at this moment in their life. But hopefully uh, one or two of them over the six-week series uh, may be able to help you with whatever New Beginnings God is uh, starting anew in your life in 2024. The book of Acts is formally titled the Acts of the Apostles, and that word apostle comes from the Greek word to send. So therefore, an apostle is someone who's sent out with something important to give to another or to share with another. In this case, it's the Acts of the Apostles of Jesus that are sent with the words of grace and hope and salvation, proclaiming the mighty acts of God in Jesus' name. Now, we're going to get to the making fire part of the story a little bit later, I promise. But first, I need to give you some background. The people of Israel had to deal with foreign occupation for centuries. And during Jesus' life, it was the Roman Empire that uh, ruled over the Mediterranean and the ancient Near East. In fact, Jewish leaders petitioned Jesus' execution on grounds that he was a political threat to the Roman rule. Now, Jesus' crucifixion was a crushing blow to his followers, and all their hopes and dreams for a renewed Israel were dashed. But the heartbreak was short-lived as that very first Easter Sunday changed everything for Jesus' followers. And they were so hopeful for what the future might bring now that Christ was alive again. But what, what exactly that would be, they, they didn't know. So that takes us back here to the book of Acts. Chapter 1, the first few verses. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over the course of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, the writer of the book of Acts is the same writer from the book of Luke. Uh, this is a two-part series in Jesus' life and ministry and also the birth of the Christian church. Now, both books, Acts and Luke, begin by addressing uh, the book to this individual, Theophilus. Now, the Greek name literally means lover of God, and scholars are divided. Was it a person's actual name, uh, someone that knew uh, the author of Luke and Acts, or is this more of a general name that he's addressing to any uh, follower of Jesus and lover of God? By the way, in the ancient books, uh, for the most part, they lacked punctuation, paragraphs, chapter headings, and so the authors had to incorporate more information into the text that modern writers do. So they had prefaces, and that was one way of summarizing, providing previews, marking their divisions, uh, and when more than one book was written, it usually meant because it was a longer piece than would fit on one scroll. So they divided it up over two scrolls, and to start the second scroll, the author would have a preface to sort of summarize what 
uh, sort of like a previously on The Mandalorian, and then you find out, you know, what happened last week in case you hadn't been paying attention. It's probably no surprise that the kingdom of God was one of Jesus' central themes in his ministry. Much of his teaching, his parables, his conversations and dialogue with people was just about that, about the kingdom of God. And Jesus taught the kingdom of God was both a present and a future reality. In fact, Jesus would often say, the kingdom of God is at hand, meaning that uh, aspects of the kingdom are already present. With, with his coming into the world, his beginning to uh, help this world change into the way that God originally intended. But it's also a future reality, meaning it won't be fully present in all of its glory and power until Jesus comes again uh, at the end of time. Verse 4 and 5. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So the author of Acts, I'm going to call him Luke from here on out, tells us that after Jesus' resurrection, he spent 40 days appearing to the disciples in various locations. Now, You've heard me say this before, but in the Bible, numbers mean more than just those numbers. And 40 is a number that you see throughout the Bible uh, in many different times. Um, uh, Moses uh, was up on, on, on Mount Sinai. Uh, Elijah was in the wilderness for days. Jesus uh, went out before his temptation for 40 days. And so uh, Luke tells us that, that he spent a, uh, a biblical amount of time appearing to his disciples and showing them that truly he was alive. And now he's ready to give them their final instructions. Are you ready for it? Wait. That's it. Wait. Don't leave the city, Jesus says. Something amazing is about to happen. You're going to receive the promise of the Father, and you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And they'll be like, yes, that's so amazing. No idea what that means, Jesus, but we will wait, and we will be ready for that, right? And when Jesus asks you to wait, you wait. Verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Biblical scholar J. Bradley Chance notes that the return of the Holy Spirit was regularly associated with uh, the restoration of God's people in the last days, at the end of time. And so talk about the kingdom of God by Jesus plus his resurrection. That might naturally lead the disciples uh, to be asking, is this it? Is this the beginning of the end? Is this when everything's going to come uh, to full circle the way God intended? In the years following Jesus' crucifixion, numerous protests against Roman occupation and rule in Israel took place. And some of them even uh, were uh, violent protests. This culminated with the first Jewish revolt in 66 CE, which was suppressed when the Romans captured Jerusalem, and then they completely burned and destroyed the temple four years later in 70. So, Lord, is this the time when you would restore the kingdom to Israel? This was a question that every Israelite wanted to know the answer to. Will, will we finally get our nation back, Jesus? Is this when we can be the people that God intended us to be? Is this the start of the end of time uh, when God's kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven? Now, let me pause and tell you one more insight before we move on. Most contemporary scholars believe that the book of Acts was probably written around 70 or 80 CE in the common era. That would have been three to four decades after Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. His early followers truly believed that he was going to come back in their lifetime. That didn't happen. And so some scholars believe that this uh, question by the disciples that Luke records in Acts chapter 1 is a response to the painful disappointments that the early church had when Jesus did not return like they expected him to. How does Jesus respond? Verses 7 and 8. It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father is set by his own authority, says Jesus. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He's like, it's not about the end of the world. It's about the ends of the earth, right? I am sending you out on a mission. Don't get caught up on if it's the end of all time. That's not 
for you to worry about. Never was there a more appropriate, uh, you're on a need to know basis, and right now you do not need to know that answer uh, than what Jesus said here, right? What you do need to know, Jesus says, is continue to wait until you receive the power. And that's the power that's going to enable you to make fire, like the early, the first story in our message today. Now, Luke uses the Greek word uh, for power, dynamis. Uh, you get that dynamite word from it, right? But it's a robust force at work in uh, demonstrative ways, meaning it may not be the political power, the restoration of their nation that they were hoping, but the power of the Holy Spirit will be so dynamic, it will give them everything they need to do what God is calling them to do, to go out and be witnesses, to make fire, and to, uh, to bring disciples uh, into the fold. Maybe you've heard the phrase, God doesn't call the equipped, but God equips those who are called. It's this understanding that when God gives us something to do, most of the time we feel so unprepared. Like, there's no way I can do that. I'm not ready, of course. But God says, but my spirit will give you what you need. That dynamis, that power that God gives you will, will equip us for whatever it is that God gives us. And what was it the original disciples were called to do? You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And it kind of sounds like he's just randomly like picking places on the map. But I want to show you Jesus is being very intentional. Here's a map of first century Israel. And Jerusalem was where they were. That was uh, what was taking place in Acts chapter 1. Of course, that was where uh, Jesus was crucified, uh, where he rose again. And we imagine those 40 days, according to Luke, he was in and around the city uh, meeting with all, talking with the disciples and showing them that he was alive again. So Jerusalem was the holy city. It was where people came from all over. It was the center of uh, religious, political, and culture uh, for Israel. There was a saying that all roads to salvation led through Jerusalem. So naturally, Jesus would say, we're starting here. Right where you are. This is where we're starting, and, and you're going to be my witnesses right where you are now. But then he said to Judea. Now, Judea was the southern part of Israel. It was the area that Jerusalem was a, a city in, but it was so much more. It's, it's like Jesus saying, okay, now these are your brothers and sisters, right? This is the rest. This is part of your nation. These are the people who you know and, and, and that, that, that think and look and act and, and believe like you. And now this is the opportunity to share my message of love and forgiveness and salvation with people that you feel comfortable around. That's Judea. But then Jesus had to go and mention Samaria. Now, originally, Samaria was part of the area that the 12 tribes of Israel settled into. But then in 22 BCE, the Assyrians invaded Israel and captured the capital of Samaria. And one of the practices uh, that the Assyrians did was whenever they took over a new territory, they would remove some people from that territory and bring in others from other territories that they'd conquered to live in there so that, uh, th that everyone would kind of intermarry and it sort of dilute all. You couldn't have a huge uprising because there'd be people from, from all over. And so over time, those folks intermarried with the Hebrew people that were still living there. Of course, they brought in their own culture and their own religious traditions and beliefs. And so by the time of Jesus, Samaritans were viewed with deep suspicion and disdain because they were not like the, the pure Israelites. They had uh, uh, d diluted, or they might even say polluted, their heritage and their religious practices by intermarrying with these uh, various cultures and religious beliefs. That's why the story of the Good Samaritan would be so shocking, because there was no Good Samaritan in Jesus' day. They were the enemies, the dreaded, the hated people that don't do things the right way, right? And then Jesus finishes off his marching orders, their marching orders to the disciples, by commissioning them to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. Okay, so you start where you are in Jerusalem, right? Where you are right now, what you know. Then you reach out to the people that you're comfortable with and familiar with. That's the, uh, in Judea. And then he calls us to reach out to the folks we don't like. Now, you may be thinking, Pastor Jim, I don't have any enemies today. I'm, I'm fine. Okay. What about folks whose political opinions infuriate you? Yeah, love them. 
And what about those people whose backgrounds or lifestyles make you uncomfortable? Embrace them as well. Oh, and then one more thing Jesus says. Once you've done that, then go to everyone else, everywhere else, right? To the ends of the earth. And it feels like overwhelming. There's no way we can do that, which is exactly true. There's no way we can do that on our own. That's why Jesus said, I'm sending the power of the Holy Spirit, the dynamis, the, the dynamite power, the, 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 the uh, ability to do what God has called us to do. Wait for that power, because on your own, you can't do it. Verse 9. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going, and they were gazing upwards to heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come again in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So this is Jesus' ascension, right, going back to be with uh, God the Father. And devout Jews would have undoubtedly made connections between Jesus being lifted up into the heavens and Elijah that was taken up on a chariot of fire. Uh, according to the Old Testament, he didn't die, but was taken up to be with God in a whirlwind. And two of the most notable figures in Israel's history, both departing from this world in dramatic fashion. Now, the disciples, of course, are, are flabbergasted. They're, they're, they're caught with their mouths hanging open as they're watching this amazing scene take place when suddenly two men in white robes stood beside them and they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand up looking towards heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And we might remember that on that first Easter morning, there were two men in white robes that met uh, Mary and the other women that came to the tomb that first Easter uh, to tell them about Jesus' resurrection. Angels? Probably. Uh, Luke doesn't say specifically. But he gives the disciples here in Acts chapter 1 the uh, don't just stand there, do something speech, right? You, are, you already have your marching orders. You know what Jesus has called you to do. You're to be witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. They may not have been witnesses to the resurrection, right? That happened inside the tomb when everybody, when it was dark and nobody was around, but they were witnesses to the ascension. So now their testimony would be even more powerful about what uh, about Jesus' life. Now, for us, we weren't there to see the ascension, but we can talk about the power that we have experienced by coming to know Jesus and how God has made a, a change in our lives and has been with us through the ups and the downs and got us through times that we never imagined on our own. This is about new beginnings. And suddenly, without the presence of their leader and master, the disciples find themselves in new territory. The book of Acts, the story of Acts, is really isn't just history. It's an invitation for us to continue in that tradition of what Jesus began. In fact, in seminary, they said the, 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 one of the most powerful ways to read the Bible is to try to put yourself in that place. And in fact, one of my professors said to put yourself in the least likely, uh, least likable uh, position in, in Scripture. But in this case, put ourselves in, in the place of the disciples, the apostles, that, that God has called us now to be God's witnesses. And, and maybe you're not the kind of person, I'm guessing most of us are not, that's going to go stand on street corners and hold up signs and bring our, uh, our loud uh, bullhorns to, to ask people, if are they saved? But be sharing the good news of the kingdom of God, it's not about even a membership drive to kind of get more people to come to the church. We say this every week. At Palmdale United Methodist Church, we're inspired by Jesus to love. And there are, this is, being witnesses, it can be as simple enough as letting people uh, know that they are loved, especially when they don't know that they're loved by God or they don't feel like they're loved by God. And oftentimes, they don't feel their love by God because they feel judged from different people or situations. Maybe they've even felt abandoned by God. 
Jesus didn't come for us to put his picture up on our walls. He didn't come so that we could wear crosses around our necks and put the the fish stickers on the backs of our cars. He didn't give his life away so that we could be the biblical gatekeepers, proudly stating to anyone who listened who's in and who's out of God's kingdom. No, Jesus came to teach us to make fire. He came to free us from the grip of sin and evil and condemnation. He came to bring life, as John says, uh, in all of its abundance. He came to embrace this world with his arms of love, and we are those arms now that can embrace others. What took place a few days later on the day of Pentecost, as the disciples were doing exactly what Jesus asked to be waiting uh, for the power of the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit came upon them in a dramatic way. You can read about it in the second chapter of Acts. In fact, that's your homework for today. I I fully planned on preaching on Acts chapter 2, and then I got nine pages into my sermon. I'm like, I can't write another nine pages. I'm going to have to call it a day. So you're going to have to, to read that. But this, uh, this was the birth of the church. This empowered these um, timid and uh, unsure followers to be bold and to start carrying the message of Jesus to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. May we never forget that we've been called to be on fire for God's kingdom. And it's not our words necessarily, uh, what we have to say to someone, but it's our lives, how we uh, relate to people, how what they see and what we do and how we uh, react to what's happening in this world and in other people's lives. We have been called to be witnesses of God's transforming and redeeming power to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So don't leave today and just simply say, that was a nice sermon, Pastor Jim. Because then we miss the whole power of what this is about. May we lead lives that will lead others to come to know that loving and forgiving and amazing grace of God. This is our new beginning. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we sing our closing song, We're going old school in the praise department. Shine, Jesus, shine. Verse, so I went for the uh, sip of water. 
as we get ready to go, may we, uh, may we be the Pentecost church. May we be the, the church that, uh, that it remembers the art of making fire, of loving others when others uh, do not love them, and by reaching out and showing what it means to care for those in need in our community. May you be uh, on fire for God, not just this week, not just this month, not just this year, but for the rest of your life, knowing that God's Holy Spirit will give you what you need to be able to love others the way Jesus taught. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.